Hi, I'm Tom Bloomer. We're filming this at the Lausanne Basin, Switzerland. I'm going to talk to you today about one of my uh, favorite people in the Bible. There are leadership lessons here that we can learn from this person and that we need to apply. So I want to encourage you to follow the example of this person, turn your prison into a school, learning from God, and then into a place of worship. I'm going to tell a story today, and most of the good stories begin like this. Once upon a time, long ago and far away, a princess was born. But she was born into a family where they didn't know that she was a princess destined to become a queen. And in these stories, that's often the case. The princess or the prince doesn't know their true identity, therefore they don't know their, their true role in life, nor their true authority. And part of the tension and the reason we watch these things over and over and we listen to them and we read those books is we're waiting to see when and how they find out who they really are. Anyway, it was very clear that this little girl was extraordinary. She was very beautiful. She was very intelligent, spiritually sensitive, <clears throat> and the kind of girl who could organize all the kids in the village into games and stuff because people just liked following her. There are people like that. And as she grew up, <clears throat> Her parents were concerned because she was a, and a wonderful little girl, but they were poor and they did not have the money for a dowry. And so especially as she became a woman, young woman ready for marriage, they, they really didn't know what to do. There was nobody suitable in the village. But the fame of this girl's beauty had gone far and wide. And one day, uh, an obviously wealthy man rode into the village. Uh, wealthy because, for one thing, he was riding a horse. And even in Europe in the 18th century, not every, only, only wealthier people had horses. Much less this traditional society long ago. So he rode in, <clears throat> beautiful horse, well-dressed, asked the way to her parents' house and introduced himself and uh, said that he had heard about their daughter and he was looking for a wife. And he explained his situation. He was a rancher, a large landowner, and he said, I don't need a dowry and she'll have anything she wants. Um, we have merchants coming out to the ranch regularly and she can choose any, any jewelry, any clothing. And he gave presents then to the parents and asked if he could meet the girl. And they said yes. They were just amazed by all this. It seemed like an answer to prayer. And so they brought her out <clears throat> and he had a gift for her as well. And she was even more beautiful than he had heard. So he asked if he could come back and see her and yes. And then that second time he asked if they could arrange a date for the marriage. It all happened very quickly. But each time he came, he brought gifts, and the parents were happy for their daughter. The guy seemed nice enough. The day of the wedding came, and they were very surprised to see that he brought no family with him, just the foreman of his ranch. But he had paid for a big meal for the whole village and more presents for the parents. And so they were married, and then she rode off with him. And the ranch was every big as, as big as, as uh, he had said. It's true that the house needed organizing and cleaning. And, <clears throat> and it was a big job this, for this teenage girl. But she was very capable and had this gift of leadership. She had to learn how to work with servants. She was given five maid servants just for her personally. And then she had the whole household staff to organize. And her husband was happy to let her do it. And he was, he was taking care of the ranch. He was out every day anyway. But she was expecting to meet family or friends. And when she asked, he got very angry. And, and then she asked if she could go into town. And he said, no, we have the merchants coming out here. You don't have to go to town. So after everything calmed down and she got over her learning curve of learning how to, to manage this huge household, 
uh, she realized that her marriage was in fact a prison. And there was no way in this traditional society that she could, li that she could leave. It was a gilded prison. She did have all the clothes and all the, all the jewelry and perfume and everything that she could want and more, but it was nevertheless a prison. And her husband was irritable and had to manage to end every relationship he had with his family. He had no friends. And the reason he had traveled such a distance to find her was that none of the families who knew him wanted their daughters to be married to him. But he treated her well enough uh, and related only to the people who worked for them for him. But she, in her spiritual sensitivity, as she realized she was in prison, she decided to transform her prison into a school and spent uh, first an hour a day and then two hours a day with God. She had been instructed in the scriptures, uh, which was not always usual for a girl in that, in that society. And she knew God. And then she realized that God was calling her to be an intercessor for the kingdom. So she started praying for the kingdom and for its king. Now she knew that David was the king. How did she know this? Because her husband didn't, obviously, and we're, we're of course talking about Abigail here in 1 Samuel 25. This amazing chapter that's so rich in, in detail about this amazing woman. 1 Samuel 25, her husband uh, knows nothing of who David is, and the villages on either side are trying to betray David to Saul, so they don't know either. How did she know? Well, I think she must have heard the, the argument going on in Israel, who is our true king? And some people said Saul and his house. Others would have heard the story of Samuel going to the house of Jesse and anointing his youngest son king of Israel. So there would have been this discussion going on, who's the true king? And Abigail knew that if she was going to intercede for the kingdom, she needed to intercede for the king, so she asked God. I believe that's how she knew when nobody around her apparently did. And God told her, David is the king. So she started interceding for David, and then of course heard that he needed intercession, especially as Saul was moved into the mode of trying to kill him. So she was interceding for David, and then she heard that he and his men had, in their in their flight from Saul, had set up camp in the, in the hills up above their ranch. One day, we read in, in this passage, David sent his men down to the ranch to see Nabal, which means fool in Hebrew, and he's called a fool three times in this passage. And Nabal said, please greet, uh, no, David said to his men, greet Nabal for me in the traditional way and say this, now I have heard that you have shepherds and we have not insulted them, nor have we, have you missed anything? You have not missed a single animal all season, either to wild beasts or to theft. And let us find favor with you on your festive day. If you have any food, uh, we would love to accept it. Now, this is a very traditional uh, and culturally right thing for them to do. And sheep shearing or any kind of harvest is so much work that people make a festival out of it. There's the best food and, and it, everyone's together doing all this hard work and, and that's, that's how uh, society handles it. We do the same here in Switzerland for the grape harvest. We actually still have the school vacation because the children had to be free for two weeks in October to help pick the grapes. Now they don't, the children don't do that anymore, but we still have the vacation. So the young man did this. They rode down and they greeted Nabal in this way. And Nabal said, well, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are running away from their masters. Should I take my bread and drink and meat that I have slaughtered for my own men 
and give it to a man, give it to men whose origin I do not know? Now this is a deadly insult in most cultures to, to insult people's origins, to say they have unknown origins. And Nabal is probably referring to the story that people had heard that the Jews still believe that David's mother was not married to his father when he was conceived. Which would explain how he began Psalm 51, in sin my mother conceived me. It's not that sex within marriage is evil as some of the church has thought at certain times and places. It's that it was literally a sin when he was conceived. And it would have been because his parents were not married at the time. And that would be why when Samuel asked to see all the sons of Jesse, <clears throat> that he brought them all out except David. Not only was David watching the sheep, but David was the son of shame. Anyway, they went back and, and reported this to David. And David got furious. He was not having a good week anyway, because he just heard that Samuel had died. And his last link with this word of the Lord was then gone. There's a line in, in one of the Psalms about Joseph. It says, the, the word of the Lord tested him. And if we have a word of the Lord, it will test us. And the more powerful and long-term that word is, the more severe the testing and the longer it will last. We know it lasted years in Joseph's life, and this was the time of testing in David's life. He had been anointed king. And as usually happens when the word is first given, it looks like everything's going quickly to, to that happening. He, was, he had the victory over Goliath. He became general of the armies of, of Israel. He was in the house of the king, best friend, friends with the son of the king, no longer a, a, a shepherd boy, the son of shame. And then all of a sudden Saul turns on him and starts trying to kill him. So he has to run for his life, gathers a, a bunch of criminals and tax evaders around him, people who hadn't even done a DTS, and he, they're running from Saul, literally. And then, after guarding this guy's sheep all season, he's insulted by this man who's known to be a fool by everyone around him. So that, that, was, that was the last straw for David. Nabal and the men around him had been drinking all afternoon after their, their main meal. <clears throat> they hadn't even realized what they'd done. There was one young man there, though, who had done a DTS. And he went straight to Abigail in uh, verse 14 and told her what he, had, what, what he had seen. He said, Our master scorned David's men, but they were very good to us. We didn't miss any animal as long as we were with them. They were like a wall to us both by night and by day. Now, please do something, because um, we're in big trouble here. We could all die. And our master is such a, a Nabal, such a worthless man, that no one can even speak to him. So Abigail doesn't try to go to her husband either. She knows what he's like and he's drunk. And she just organizes her whole household lines up a whole bunch of donkeys, like, well, not like this one, actually. This is a Mexican donkey that's really cute, but Abigail's look different. And she loaded them up with all the good things of the house. She loaded them up with raclette cheese, Swiss chocolate. Now, whatever is good in your culture, you can imagine that she loaded it up. In this culture, it was Bread, wine, prepared sheep for eating, slaughtered sheep, roasted grain, and, and dried uh, fruit. And she said to her young man, you go on before me and I'll come right after, after you. So she sends him to where they know David will be coming down the mountain. And David is riding along, grumbling in his beard. It was in vain that I guarded all that man has. And I'm going to kill him dead now because he insulted me. I'm going to kill him so dead. I'm going to kill him deader than dead. He's going on like this. And he hears something and, and looks up, and there's a donkey train coming toward them. 
led by young men, and they look at these donkeys, and it's all this wonderful food that they haven't had in weeks. They've been living on a roasted rabbit in their cave. And then he looks up again and sees this beautiful woman, very well dressed, lovely jewels. And then the donkey stops, and she stops near him, jumps off her donkey and bows, and then comes over right at his stirrup and bows before him. And at that point, a wave of perfume comes up and hits him right between the eyes. The text doesn't actually say this, but I was in the Middle East in one of our DTSs in Egypt, and all the students were from the Middle East, and I said, now, a wealthy woman from at this, in this place, would she not have very nice perfume? And they all said, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> and as we know, the Egyptians were probably the ones who invented makeup. And probably ladies have always wanted to smell nice since the beginning of, of the garden. Anyway, she gives David, she starts out with this nonverbal feminine message and then gives a seven point message that she has not had time to study up on. She's not had time to call her pastor, to talk to her best friends, to consult the internet, nothing. But she has a message that stops David in his tracks. I believe that she was ready at that time because of her walk with God, because she knew the principles of the kingdom so well, having learned them as an intercessor, that she was able to tell David what he needed to hear. She was the prophetic voice to David in that moment. And we won't go through the, her seven points in detail, I'll leave that to you, but she, she says, uh, roughly, she takes responsibility she says, I didn't see the young men, but please do not shed blood today and accept my gifts and the sin shall be on me. She took responsibility for her husband's sin. We used to have a teaching in, a sh in the church that Abigail was a bad example because she was rebellious. I think that's really stupid because she saved her husband's life and it was, uh, he was obviously not worth it and she risked her own life to do it because David was a very violent guy, as you know, so violent he was not allowed to build the temple, there was so much blood on his hands and he was in a very vulnerable state and who knows what he could have done. So she really did risk her life, not knowing David personally but just knowing what the Lord was calling her to do. But then she comes to the heart of her message. Um, she says, when you come into your kingdom, verse 30, uh, and he, when you are appointed ruler over Israel, do not let an evil act, an unjust act, mar your kingdom. In other words, don't build uh, injustice into the foundation of your kingdom. And that you will do if you commit this violence today. And that, that's how we know that she knew that David was to be king. And then David says, his, his apostolic anointing picks up on this prophetic voice. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. If, if you had not, I would have avenged myself by my own hand. So Abigail turns around, goes back, and uh, sees that Nabal is not capable of listening to her. So she waits till the next morning and tells him. And the text says, his heart became as a stone within him. And a medical doctor in my church said that's a very good description of a heart attack. Ten days later, the Lord struck him, again, probably, and he died. David heard about this and blessed the Lord again and sent some young men to Abigail 
And they arrived and said, David has sent us to take you as his wife. And she said, okay, I'm all packed, let's go. That's actually not in the text, but she's, she gave him, her, him, them, the traditional greeting, your maidservant is a maid to do the will of my, to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Uh, but she didn't do that, actually. That's just the traditional response. But she was obviously packed because as soon as she rose up, she was ready to ride out on her donkey and her five maidservants. And let me tell you something, especially the single guys. Ladies do not move to a cave without a lot of luggage. They, this, you can be sure that there were many donkeys packed up with what she was going to need to live for the next who knows how many months until David could come into the kingdom. So she had to be all packed. She was expecting David to ask her to be his wife because I believe the Lord had already told her that. Because the very last part of her, her message, her seventh point, is when the Lord shall deal well with you, then remember me. So the Lord must have told her, you intercede for David as king, and one day you will marry, he will marry you. That's why she said this right at the end, and David heard it. And he said, this woman is so beautiful and extraordinary, if, if Nabal ever dies, I'm going to marry her. And that's exactly what he did. And we know from other texts that she, she lived with him in Hebron when he was king there and bore him a son there. Okay, what can we learn from, from this passage? One is this picture of intercession. The righteous intercessor, when judgment is coming against a, a town or a city or a nation, deserved judgment for evil, even coming from God, the intercessor has the role of standing in the gap, as Moses did when God was set to destroy all of Israel. And the Lord said, I'll start out with you, but this bunch from Abram, I'm going to destroy them. Um, Moses risked his life and said, take me, but spare them. That's exactly what Abigail did for her husband and her, um, the household, all the men in the household. Second principle, if the Lord spoke to her that she would be David's wife, then she faced a huge temptation that fine day. When the young man told her, David is coming to kill Nabal. Now, Remember, the Lord told her, you'll be David's wife. So David's coming to kill her husband, to set her free from prison. She could have been tempted to say, okay, thank you, Lord. I'm going to go visit mom this afternoon and stay there a couple days, and I'll come back, and this whole ranch will be mine. I'm free from my prison. She did not do that. She not only stayed with her, her husband, she saved his life. Knowing that God had promised that she'd be married to, uh, to David, but <clears throat> she did not take the unrighteous shortcut, and she did not want her relationship with David to be based on a violent act. <clears throat> so this is the principle. As we begin our ministries, especially, but any time during our ministries, we can be tempted into unrighteous shortcuts into violence in our relationships. For example, our pastor won't release us to join YWAM full time. So we can be tempted to just slam the door on that relationship. They're not listening to God, I am out of here. That's a violent shortcut. Another one is often financial. And we know God's told us about this ministry. We see the vision. We see so clearly what we could do with that money. But we know it's not right. We're tempted to take that shortcut. When we were, had just begun our ministry here, I think it was in the third year, <clears throat> there was a Christian businessman, a new convert, 
<coughs> who had taken some shortcuts in business himself. And he, he came to me one day, we'd gotten to be friends and we'd prayed with him and he said, listen, I just sold a, a house here and I can give you uh, 10,000 francs, just sign here. He had a paper and I said, uh, what's this say? And he said, it says that you found the, the buyer for me. So this is the buyer's fee I can give you and it'll reduce my, my taxes and you'll have 10,000 francs. <clears throat> well, one of those early years we were on staff here, we kept track of our expenditures and it, they all fit on a piece of paper this big. We had very little support, and that 10,000 was a huge temptation. We didn't have a car, but I knew I could not accept it because I didn't find the buyer for that house, and it would have been a lie, and I could actually have gotten in big trouble over it. Probably wouldn't have because they don't check up on those kind of things here, but who knows? Anyway, I said, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. And the guy was very unhappy with me, got angry, probably because he was feeling guilty himself, knowing that that wasn't right. And as a new Christian, he was still learning about telling the truth at all times and things like that. And I knew it would cost me, and he cut off relationship and stopped supporting us. But uh, a couple years later, then he did uh, come back and start supporting us again. But I know firsthand of this temptation to violent shortcuts at the beginning of things. And there again, it's this prophetic role that keeps the apostle on the straight and narrow, not only for God's purposes and God's vision, but done in God's way. And if you are a visionary apostle, pray for that prophetic person. Ask the Lord to send, a, send you a prophet or prophets. David's leadership, we, we kind of idealized David as the perfect king, but he actually made several mistakes in his leadership, especially with his son Absalom, and it nearly cost him the kingdom. <coughs> and the Lord did send him other prophets at different times, but Abigail was not with him during that business with Absalom. And if she had been, maybe she would have been able to give him that prophetic word as she did on this day. We don't know what happened to her. We, we read that one passage about her bearing a son in Hebron and then we hear nothing more from her. So apparently she died young and was not with David. And that was to his loss and the, the cost of, the, of uh, some of the things that happened in the kingdom were so difficult. We need people to hold us to account. And David had a problem which I identify with. He didn't like confrontations. He didn't confront his sons when they did wrong. He didn't confront Joab. He left things, he let things go and he let problems pile up so that then on his deathbed he told Solomon to deal with, with the problems that he left behind. So he had this uh, confrontation avoidance that many leaders have. And um, maybe Abigail could have helped him with that. We don't know. The other thing we see in this text is a, is a common uh, organizational dynamic. And, and that is when the young people, in this case it's Nabal, and I think he was older than David, but he's so immature he acts like he's younger. The young people in an organization, they're not grateful to the older people. And they want the kingdom and they want it now. We see this dynamic in families when children want the fa family inheritance now. I was talking with one uh, Swiss businessman and, and he said, can't they just wait till I die? <laughs> they wanted him to sell the family home and move to an apartment so they could have the money. Same with, thing with another Swiss lady I know who actually owned a chateau and had hoped to live there till the end of her days and this, this uh, family insisted that she move out into an apartment so they could have the chateau. 
We see this in organizations as well, when the younger people want to take over from the older. There's a type of leadership that's a wall. It's, in other words, it's not visible, <coughs> but it's like a, a spiritual protection. And it keeps away the problems while the, the younger leaders are free to do their work down on the plain. But this, this leadership of elders is like a wall of protection. Then the young moons in their immaturity don't even realize that it's there or that they need it. <clears throat> they think, oh, I've done all this by myself. I've raised all these sheep and I'm not going to share them. So there's this tempt temptation to ingratitude and lack of recognition of the older generation. And if this is carried too far, the enemy really gets into it and it turns into a spirit of Absalom. And it's, it's the, the younger son uh, wanting the kingdom so bad that he's willing to kill the king. And this is the spirit that came into YWAM in the 80s and 90s. And finally, through the prayers of many intercessors, not just within YWAM, but without, we, um, we were able to stop the working of that spirit. Some of our leaders who'd come under it, come under it left the mission and took their ministries out of YWAM, and the rest who stayed recommitted to, to the values of the mission. And it was the leadership of Lauren and Darlene themselves that had come under attack. And, <clears throat> and the resistance to the values that they'd received from God through different words of the Lord. It really was the spirit of Absalom. But the Lord delivered us from it due to his faithfulness. So that's a very common temptation in organizations. And that kind of dynamic, I found out later, is very common in churches also and in other mission organizations. So it's just the one way the enemy has found to destroy unity, and it works so well, he just uses the same strategies over and over again. He's not very creative. The other temptation in this is when there's that ingratitude, usually from the younger generation, then the temptation of the elder is to lash out in violence. Oh, I'm going to cut them out of my will. I'm going to kick them out of the organization. And Lauren, through this whole process of over 15 years of being bitterly criticized by some of his spiritual sons and daughters, through that whole process, he never fell into this temptation of a violent reaction. And I have the greatest respect for him for that. He worked very hard to try to keep everyone in the organization <clears throat> and keep the unity of, of the mission. <clears throat> Finally, it came to the point where they decided to leave and they left, but we all were able to maintain relationship with them and stay friends, even though we couldn't work together any longer. So there's this, this twin temptation of ingratitude by the youngers, refusing to recognize the role and the gift that the elders have been to them, and then the temptation to the elders of the violent reaction against those ungrateful young people. So, what can we do about that? Well, there are two disciplines <clears throat> that I think are more important than we realize. And one is gratitude. Gratitude is a discipline. And I think pretty much in YWAM we're, pre we're good at gratitude. We are, I know, toward the, the speaker. There's speaker hospitality and, and thanking the speaker that's done well in most YWAM locations. And some it's not. And we need to recover that ministry of hospitality. Uh, one of our dynamic hospitality ladies, Rita, she teaches on this and was invited to teach a bunch of young leaders recently <coughs> in 2014, I think. 60 of them, I think. And she asked how many of them knew that hospitality was a condition to be a spiritual leader. And only 20% of them knew that. Even though as, as leaders, they should have read 1 Timothy 3 already. <laughs> but for too many people in YWAM, hospitality is a department on the base that's underfunded and undermanned, underwoman most of the time, but 
Sometimes we see a guy working in hospitality. But it actually is not a department, it's the ministry of every leader. And if you're not hospitable, you're not a leader. That's the definition. And one of the reasons for it is that hospitality protects us from this dynamic uh, that we just talked about of the intergenerational reactions. If you have eaten a meal with me, it's, and, and you eat meals with me regularly, it's difficult to get really angry. <laughs> we can manage it, but it makes it more difficult. It makes, more likely, it makes it more likely that we will forgive, that we will try to understand why that other person acted like this. So we need to remember that <clears throat> both gratitude and hospitality, which are linked, and which we see linked in this passage, are very important for spiritual leadership. Nabal was ungrateful to David. He did not show hospitality. If he had, he would have been blessed because he would have been welcoming the king, the future king. But he was ungrateful and refused hospitality, which in his culture was, was really, really a wrong thing to do. And the excuse he made in public was that David was illegitimate, the son of shame. But that wasn't really an ex a good excuse, which is why David reacted so violently. So I just want to encourage all of us First, in this area of gratitude, who has been like a wall to you in your life? Who, they haven't been there with you in the, in the battle, down on the plain, but they've been up, out there like a screen, screening out the attacks of the wild beasts and the thieves. For some of us, it's our pastor, our elders. Others, it's our parents, grandparents, spiritual parents. Most of us who've been long-term in the mission have intercessors who are like that for us. And that's a, a, one of the roles of an intercessor, is to be that, that wall of protection around those who we're praying for. <clears throat> Just having some people praying for safety as we travel is a precious, precious gift. So let's be thinking about those people. Who, who are they? Who were they? and thanking the Lord for them, and thanking them if we haven't thanked them recently. And the other thing is let's recommit to hospitality um, on our YWAM basis. We, we've got to be more intentional about this, and don't just leave it with one untrained person with very little money, and no access to a car to go into town, for example. Um, it has to be an extension of the ministry of the leaders of that base, of that place. And so I wrote a, a paper about this that's in our reference guide for the university. I think it's called The Role of the Speaker in the University of the Nations. <clears throat> and I wrote it in response to a school leader who said, why can't we get good uh, speakers in our schools? As he had invited a guy who refused to come to that base to teach, but the guy paid his own way all the way to West Africa to teach. Um, and it was because of the fellowship. I knew at the base that couldn't get speakers is because they, they didn't practice hospitality. They had a nasty little speaker's room. It was very cramped. And none of the leaders invited the, the visiting speaker over or had any interaction with them during the week. They, their job was to teach the students and the leaders were off doing their thing. We followed the example of, of Don and Dion. We always, one of us, tried to meet the speaker at the airport, um, made sure that the hospitality person was in contact with them daily, had them over to our house at least once. So every week we would have the speaker over to our, our house personally try to take them out and visit the area, especially if they weren't from here. So these are things we can do to practice hospitality. And that hospitality ministry of YWAM <clears throat> has been one of the greatest sources of blessing to us. For me personally, because we practiced hospitality, not just for school speakers, but we would have uh, seminars here in this building for spiritual leaders. 
And we would have them over to our house uh, for lunch, partly because there wasn't enough room in the dining room for everybody. But the relationships we made during those years when we opened our home to spiritual leaders are still with me today. I'm going to meet with a group of spiritual leaders and their wives. We've been meeting regularly for 35 years to pray. We've prayed for each other's children and now the grandchildren and it's been a source of huge blessing to me personally. So I just want to encourage us all in this vital ministry of, of hospitality, which is not just about material stuff. It's not just nice serviettes and, and that kind of thing and Swiss chocolate, although just keep that chocolate coming, folks, especially the dark stuff. It's, it's really a spiritual ministry, and things happen in the spirit when we open our homes and our lives to other people. And I was thinking about this when my wife passed away. I had so many testimonies of, of her hospitality people wrote in. Some of them I, I hadn't even known about. And a, several of them were from people who'd visited us once, 30 years ago, and they remembered Cynthia's welcome. They remembered coming into our home for a cup of coffee and not just having a cup of coffee in the base dining room. And I thought about that and I got a deeper revelation, I think, of why, why hospitality is so meaningful, why it's so important in so many cultures, even outside of the Judeo-Christian culture. And I think it must go back to Eden. When we lived in a perfect home and then through our own disobedience we had to leave and we became exiles from Eden. And so we still have this feeling of exile. And the folk music of every culture in the world practically shows this because it's in minor key. It's a sad music, that means. And then when we're in, a, in another land, another culture, we feel it more strongly. This foreignness, by definition. I, I don't feel like I belong here. But if the people there tell you that you belong and that you are welcome, it heals us all the way back to Eden. That rejection that we experienced, which was so marked us so deeply, that in, in the words of C.S. Lewis, we always have with us this feeling of homesickness, even if we're still living in the house where we were born and raised. We know that we're not home yet until we meet our God and develop a deeper relationship with Him, and then we are home. <coughs> And of course, our ultimate home going will be when we see him face to face. But on this earth, when we are welcomed into someone's home, we are healed of that deep rejection, righteous though it was, and as loving as it was, still it was rejection, and we had to leave our home. And then every time we're welcomed back into a home, it is, it is a, a healing of that past hurt, but also a prophetic sign that we will be welcomed ultimately into the embrace of our Father again. So this, I believe, is another reason that hospitality is so important. It's part of the very nature of God that He welcomes those who have felt unwelcome. That He, he calls the exiles into a home. So Lord Jesus, we thank You for Abigail and for her example. We thank you for the leadership lessons of her life. Help us to really assimilate these, these lessons. And also the final one, that any kind of prison we feel like we're in, for Abigail it was a marriage, for others it's singleness. It can be a job, it can be a ministry, it can be a YWAM base. If we feel like we're in a prison, by your transforming power we can see that prison become a school and ultimately a place of worship. And the walls just fade into mist as we focus on you. Lord, I ask for grace for all of us also in these ministries of gratitude and hospitality that are so closely linked together. And we thank you for your love, for your example and your power that we can live according to your example. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>